Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Geopolitical Investing Podcast here on our channel, the Geopolitical Investors Cafe. I am your host, Javier Novoa, and I'm very excited this week to once again be hosting this podcast. And this podcast is basically a journal for me to basically flesh out my maps on investments. And if you'd like to watch and hopefully benefit and hopefully have a conversation with me, that will be all the better. I also want to timestamp what I say so that I can have a real-time tracking of my accuracy here, not only to appeal to possible future investors, but also simply to be able to improve my approach by observing where I was right, where I was wrong. Please do note that this is simply a journal. This is not investment advice. I'm not an investment advisor. I am not a financier. I'm not an accountant. As you'll see, I'm not an expert in anything. What I am is passionate about geopolitics, about investing, about intuition, and all of the topics that run along this vein. So again, take this, if you will, as a conversation between friends. Take this as sort of an entertainment value podcast and do with the information what you will, but do not say that I advise you I'm an investment advisor. Ladies and gentlemen, it is November 9th, 2024. In case you've been under a rock, or if you're perhaps in another country besides the United States, we had a historic week this week. Donald Trump was elected as the 47th president of the United States. Of course, as it always does when Republicans get elected, usually at least, markets heightened immediately thereafter. I am reading an article here from Fox Business. It is entitled... Trump win gives U.S. stops the best week of the year. That's right. We saw the best week of the year in the U.S. stock market. The Dow touched 44,000 points for the first time this week. I tend to sort of accept and fall in line with the fact that the Dow continuously goes up. I am less and less convinced that there's going to be a huge crash that sets everything back permanently. It could do it temporarily, guys. Could indeed do it temporarily, and we have to be ready for that. But I think because of human nature, uh, markets do tend to go up, if for nothing else, for inflationary purposes, but even adjusted for inflation, they do tend to go up. Of course, the S&P was nearing 6,000, and I do believe, even though... Of course, from an Austrian perspective, Trump did make a lot of mistakes in the last administration, and he will no doubt make a lot of mistakes in this one, including tariffs, which I believe are big mistakes. They are not free market measures. I believe that free market is best for the long-term health of the economy. However, he will do enough on the flip side with lifting of regulations, and perhaps most importantly, simply boosting confidence, guys. The economy deals a lot with confidence. It deals a lot with credit. So my, say, four-year forecast for what that's worth, for the two cents that that's worth, of the economic outlook for the next two years, I think it's good. I think we will have some pain in the short term, but I think the economic outlook is good, and I think there will be more opportunities than ever in these next two to four years for us to really get some financial traction. I think there will be many new millionaires and billionaires. There will be many new business opportunities. We're going to be exploring those in the podcast to come. Again, with geopolitics, even with emerging markets, I think the prospects of peace are better for this next four years. Again, not endorsing any candidate, but Donald Trump is the peace candidate. He's the one who's known for bringing people to the table, negotiations, and hopefully more and more people will be happy and will have more economic growth. The red wave that catapulted President-elect Trump to a second term, he even won the popular votes, guys, which is historic. They usually win the electoral vote, but don't win the popular vote, created a green money wave for U.S. investors. The Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500 notched fresh record highs Friday and closed out the best week of the year, rising 4.7% and 4.6% respectively. 
the Nasdaq Composite hit its 31st record close of 2024, rising 5.7% for the week. Even our Vontage Jack in the Boss, which I'm still holding, guys, I still have a bullish long-term outlook for that stock, went up to about $56.00. I should have sold some. I did not trim any. I rode it all the way back down to about 47 where it sits now. But I still believe in the long-term prospects of Jack in the Box. Again, that conviction is medium to medium low. It's not high, which is why I've not bet the farm on it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about my buckets, so to speak. How I set up my investment account to balance risk and to also allow for those social arbitrage bets that we're going to talk about here, those geopolitical bets as well. But another stock that they say is the Trump bet, and this really lived up to that, is called Geo. It's a prison stock. And we're going to be talking about a few stocks later that prove the thesis that you can make returns of multiples of 2 to 10 times on stocks. Many people say, well, Javier, that's not possible. It's not going to happen. You have to simply steadily climb 5 to 10% per year. These stocks prove otherwise. Geo stock, ladies and gentlemen, which is the prison stock, which usually goes up when a Republican candidate wins, it is the Trump bet, is up 86.6% in the past six months. That's just the stock. Now, if you're going into a strategy that we use here, which is buying options, buying call options on those stocks, imagine the multiples, guys. You could have at least gotten 10 to 100 times your money by betting on that stock. I never bet on that stock, unfortunately. It's one of those buys that I wished I had bought, but I simply didn't have enough conviction, guys, that Trump would have won. It was very close. So for those who did have the conviction and made all of that money, kudos to you. I hope we'll be smart enough in the future to make that recap. Bet. So and just again, this is me sort of going through random uh, topics of investing to see if I can source ideas, to see if just by listening to myself, we can source some ideas. We're still waiting on that big bet, that geopolitical or trend bet, which we only are expecting one or two in a year, guys, that's going to catapult us to multiples of our money at least two times, maybe 10 to 100 times our money, and we're looking for that just once a year. I have not found it yet. But at any rate, oil prices started the week on a weaker note as concerns over potential U.S.-Iran negotiations stirred speculation about future supply changes. Imagine this, guys. Concerns about peace. People are concerned that there may be peace. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. That, they lowered interest rates again. Is this going to lead to inflation again? More inflation? It remains to be seen, not to mention Wednesday. The markets had a huge response due to the election of Donald John Trump as the next president of the United States. Many stocks were up. All of our stocks were up. Again, they dropped back down a little bit the following day. And Geo, of course, on that day was way up. I think 30%. It was insane. In geopolitical developments, the markets began to price in uncertainties surrounding the U.S.-Iran relationship, especially given Trump's promise to revisit foreign policy, which analysts speculated could lead to sanctions adjustments. And again, this remains to be seen with the next topic on President Trump that we are going to discuss here. Additionally, Trump's victory fueled investor sentiment around potential deregulation oil production increases, which could counterbalance inflationary pressures if enacted. The energy sector saw mixed reactions as oil supply concerns lingered amid potential sanctions, discussions. The point is, you, at least this week, it was thought that Trump may have discussions with Iran, and I have an intuition that that's going to happen, which would lead to oil price drops, but on the flip side, it would lead to an economic renaissance in Iran, which we're going to discuss briefly in the next few moments. 
What is the geopolitical influence? Well, I've taken some notes just from an aggregation of the news here. Trump's win and speculation over Middle East peace discussions sparked notable interest in sectors like energy and defense. Everyone knows that Trump is going to try to usher in peace. This administration has been more concerned with supporting war against global foes rather than trying to sit down and negotiate and figure out solutions for these geopolitical problems. Trump will come and bring solutions to the table and he will make everyone sit down together and perhaps stop their bickering which could drag the entire world with them. Investors are watching for signs of potential sanctions relief on oil producing nations which could soften oil prices long term but again there's a flip side to this which we'll talk about. At the same time ongoing tensions with Iran could keep markets volatile with the energy sector poised for reactive moves based on diplomatic pro progress. Equity markets, there was mixed performance this week with the S&P 500 ending down 0.96% for the week, while tech outperformed, of course, on strong earnings due to the AI hype, which I believe is hype, but that will remain to be seen. Bonds, Treasury yields rose slightly with the 10-year yield settling at 4.24%. Energy sector, sensitive to geopolitical news, Oil remained in focus with ongoing speculation about U.S.-Iran relations and potential supply impacts on that. So, that is this week's news on the financial markets. Now, what's my take? Well, I kept the same positions that I was in last week, and that's namely Jack in the Box and Silver. I'm keeping my Jack in the Box position. I've been doing more research. You see, believe it or not, it is a known maxim of the great trader George Soros. He always said, invest first, research later. And of course, that is sort of tongue in cheek. You should do your research. But when you sense a good opportunity in your gut, you should try to lock in that opportunity a little bit. Of course, according to your risk tolerance and according to the intuition, the conviction that you have. Of course, you all know my conviction on this Jack in the Box trade is about medium to medium low, so I have not bought an extreme number of shares in Jack in the Box. I did not add more as of the last two days. I added more when it went down again, a few more, but I did not add a lot more over the last few days. Again, the conviction is medium to medium low. And it's even sort of been tempered. Why? Because on an analysis of Jack in the Box balance sheet, they do not have enough cash to cover current liabilities. It is still my general feeling and my general thought, my general thesis, that Jack in the Box brand popularity and continued growth and expansion into areas where there are no Jack in the Boxes, at least in the coming years, is going to offset that. Also, with the bringing on of a new financial team, they're going to take a different approach to the debt structure, and I believe they're going to pay off more of the debt, and they're going to dedicate more financial resources to expansion. Again, not high conviction, and so therefore I'm not betting the farm on it, but that is indeed my prediction. I want to be in on Jack and the Boss. Also, they, they acquired a few years ago Del Taco, which is a taco restaurant that is in some states, and they are doing pretty well as well, I think. And I do believe with the Trump recovery, I think the restaurant industry in general is going to recover. And I also believe there will be less of a push towards higher minimum wages, although that is happening now, and that restaurants will see a recovery from that. Again, it remains to be seen. Jack in the Box is sort of a short-term, long-term hold, and I'm going to explain that a little more when I explain my buckets. I still, again, am betting upon a recovery for Jack in the Box and a price target of at least $70. Many analysts are saying $60 to $80. I think it will be safe to sell Jack in the Box when it gets to at least $70. Could be much more. Certainly not buying options on it. I'm still holding silver, guys. I've been buying silver for the last 17 years, and I buy a little bit every month. I'm dollar cost averaging in that. New positions, again, this is not new. I've been buying Satoshis in Bitcoin since Bitcoin has been 
in the late 30s, early 40s. It is now, it touched 77 yesterday. It is easily going to get to 100,000 when Trump becomes president. I attribute a lot of this to simply the greater libertarian, shall we say, instincts that are coming in when Trump comes in, although he's not a libertarian. He has more libertarian instincts. He has also said that he is going to pardon the former CEO of uh, Silk Road. I'm forgetting his name right now, but he he was unjustly imprisoned for basically free market activity. He's going to release him. He may, again, he definitely is going to be more inclined toward free market. Bitcoin can and will thrive in that atmosphere. This is a medium high conviction rate. So I did add to my position of Bitcoin this week. And again, I'm going to continue dollar cost averaging Bitcoin, which means buying a little bit every month. And I'm just going to sit and hold it. Another um, move I made was I bought a very low number of shares in MicroStrategy. And for those of you who don't know, MicroStrategy is the former tech company of Michael Saylor, who's a huge Bitcoin proponent. And he has converted that whole company into basically a Bitcoin holding company and they are dollar cost averaging Bitcoin. So a way to own Bitcoin, a way to own a stake in Bitcoin without having to get your Bitcoin locker and so on and so forth and, and have the codes and, so, and get a node and so on, which can be difficult for some or onerous for some, you can always invest in micro strategy. That is a way to get into Bitcoin, again, without having to do the hard work and it will rise as Bitcoin rises, has also done quite well over the past few days. It's a good long-term trade, guys. It's a good long-term trade. And again, I am convinced, and I could be wrong, but I'm convinced that Bitcoin is going to a million dollars within a decade. Listen to Michael Saylor's uh, interviews on that. Would you have wanted to own a piece of New York in the 18th century? I certainly would have. So I just want to discuss how I set up my investment portfolio, and I do it with a series of four buckets, guys. And you're going to learn a little bit about my strategies, about my doctrines here, about the way I invest from this. So the first bucket, I call this my Warren Buffett bucket. It's basically long-term investments in businesses for the qualities of those businesses. And of course, for businesses, this is value investing. I look for qualities such as steady increase, at least 10% a year in net income. I look for a steady increase in earnings per share. I look for a steady increase in sales. I look for a steady increase in operating income. And I look for that steady increase in cash flow in actual cash that the business has. I also look for a multiple of cash over debt. I want a business that can cover its debts if need be. I want a good book value and so on, so forth on that. I do want a business that does not have preferred stock because of course preferred stock is nothing but glorified debt. I analyze all those metrics and I just use the traditional checklist and then I price that business based upon usually a 10 times earnings model. And then, of course, I want a margin of safety in there. This is very basic. And needless to say, guys, I don't have a single stock in that portfolio at this moment, but I am looking for one. And if you can recommend a good company that's priced well, I will be glad to listen and invest in that. This is basically a buy and hold position. I'm buying it as if I'm buying a business. And again, that's zero right now, but I'm on the lookout for those. Those are always good to hold. That's my long-term portfolio. This is probably five, ten years or more. Then I have what I call my trading portfolio. And these are usually swing trades. And these are trades, they're not necessarily based on fundamentals, but they're based upon a mixture of technical aspects, trends, and feelings. And these are stocks that I think I can make money on in the relative short term. That's under one, maybe two years at the most. I think I'm going to make an increase in my money. Jack in the Box is one of those, guys. Also, I think Bitcoin could be, and silver would have to be this because 
while there are fundamentals in silver, it follows commodities principles. It's not a company, of course. Bitcoin as well. I don't have a way to fundamentally analyze Bitcoin, so I'd have to put them in here, although they're long-term. But this is my swing trading portfolio. Jack and the Boss in there. That's basically what I'm doing now. The third portfolio is very, very important, guys. Very important. And this is my risk tolerance portfolio, or rather I could call it my Four Seasons portfolio. And what I do in this portfolio, and I've already set it up, and I, I'm actually rebalancing this now as we speak. I put a quarter into stocks, guys, a quarter of the money in that portfolio into stocks. And right now I'm putting it on the Spider, the SPY, which is the S&P 500 ETF. It basically is a compilation of, of the movements of all the stocks in the S&P 500. Then I put a quarter into precious metals. And I'm doing that with GLD right now. And it could be in silver and other precious metals. And then the other one I do in bonds. And of course I'm buying shares in the bonds. The, the, the fund that matches bonds. And then a quarter of that I do in cash. And then I rebalance that every quarter. Or it could be every year. And basically make sure that they're proportional. And this is basically to protect my money and have short term growth. That's basically somewhere to park my money. Now the fourth one. This is what this channel is about. It's the fun one, guys. It's finding those maybe once a year trades. And I'm calling it my social ARB portfolio in honor, of course, of Chris Camilo and those guys on Dumb Money who are social ARB investors. And this is basically my betting portfolio. And I'm going to talk about this with the Iran situation coming up. What Again, I don't really have a play for this. I'm just tabletop exercising it. And perhaps maybe in the comments you can tell me where I'm wrong or where you think we could... Tweet this, do better on this. And th these are for high conviction bets. And basically, I will bet, I might sell off all of the rest of the buckets and bet, bet my whole portfolio on this one move. And it's usually in options. It's going to be in options before an earnings call or an earnings report. That's going to uh, give us the most upside, but it's also going to give us the most risk. So it depends upon conviction. That's where we're going to bet on these trends, guys. I'm going to have a thesis, and it's going to be one that I have a relative amount of confidence in, and then I'm going to bet according to that, and it's going to be a big bet, and this is where that those 2x to 10x returns are going to come from. Now, a word of caution, a word of note, this is where I differ from social arbitrage, because social arbitrage is good. It basically says that I have come across a piece of information that Wall Street doesn't have, and I'm going to leverage that to bet on the stock. And then that information is going to get disseminated. And theoretically, the stock that's associated with that, of course, after a lot of research and after figuring out what the relative mix of this information, as opposed to other factors influencing the stock, is going to bear on that. I hope you understand me just a little bit. Then we make the bet on that. But I differ from social art because I don't think that you have to have information that no one else has. Why? Because if you go into Jason Apollo Voss's work on information, understanding information, you'll realize that no two people understand the same piece of information the same way, and no people will implement it the same way. So it's not the information that's the key factor here, although it's important. It's not even the dissemination of that information. Everyone could have the information. I could have a piece of information that the whole world has access to and the whole world has. First of all, even if they have access to it, it's not going to be distributed evenly. So no, not everyone's going to have it. In fact, there's public information right now that not everyone has. Second of all, even if they have it, they're not all going to understand it in the same way. Some of them won't understand it at all. There is not some objective reality that everyone sees the same way and everyone filters the same way. You can go into the philosopher Kant to understand that we all filter reality through our brains. And of course, ostensibly, all of our brains are different. So they're going to filter that information in a different way. You follow me? And even if everyone understood the information in the same way, they're not going to take actions in the same way. The action that they take, guys... It's going to be dictated by a special set of circumstances.
So not everyone's going to bet on the same information in the same way. If you have a piece of, let's just simplify this. If you have a piece of information that says oxy, occidental petroleum, is going to go up in the next two months, you might buy 100 shares or 1,000 shares. Now, depending on how many shares you buy, the price is going to be affected in a different way. Also, I may buy options on oxy, and you may buy shares. Or I may buy a certain set of options in the money, and you may buy out of the money options. You see how this works? So it's not about information. So social uh, arbitrage and Chris Camilo, while they're geniuses, guys, and they've made a lot of money, they make information the pivot point. Whereas I make behavior and how we implement that information the pivot point. Therefore, intuition is a lot more important. Therefore, I don't care if everyone has that information. I want to look at what I think is the best way for me to approach this. And really, there's no rational explanation of how to do this because there's no, as Jason Apollo Voss says, there's no future fact. There are only past facts, and even those probably aren't facts. So I'm going to basically structure my trades on my own experiences and how I feel, and I think by doing that, we will be able to move the needle. And this really cuts into the heart of my research methodology and why I'm not an analyst, why I'm not an expert, because you'll notice that analysts are broke, guys. Well, probably not broke. They probably make pretty comfortable incomes. But analysts are not you. Okay. If analysts were the smartest people out there, every single analyst would not be working for a firm. They would be Warren Buffett or George Soros level multi-billionaires, but they're not. See, and accountants. Accountants are very well paid, but why are most accountants not multi-billionaire hedge fund owners or simply multi-billionaire traders? That's a darn good question. You see, in my analysis, I sort of, it's, it might be an open secret that I might sort of have a little bit of ADD, <laughs> and that's exactly how I research my investments. I don't set out to research a stock. What I do is I just go and read something that I enjoy, and I really like geopolitics. And I'm not even an expert on geopolitics. My theory might not even be correct there. I might, eat, might not even remember who the president of Azerbaijan is. <laughs> but again, I'm not, I might not even know who the president of Azerbaijan is. But I can go read about it. And so what I do is I get on the news, I get on forums, I go on boards, I talk to people, I even talk to people like my father, the friends who's also a very experienced trader, I talk to friends of mine, and then something hits me. I rely a lot on my gut and a lot on my intuition. A piece of information hits me, and then I'll go crazy research on that company or piece of information. I might spend 20 to 40 hours just researching that company and information, maybe just say, well, this is not a high conviction trade. It doesn't call me. And that's my main standard of a trade, guys. It's something that really calls me and really pulls me and really emotionally excites me. I don't even start out with a thesis. Of course, then I develop a thesis. Then I will go and test scientifically that thesis. We're going to do that in real time on the show when I actually have a solid thesis. I do have a few theses that are emerging, and we'll talk about them, but I do not have a crystallized, solid thesis. But I'm not an expert, and I'm not an expert accountant, although I do like accounting. I study accounting. I study the financials of a company. But you don't even have to do that, guys. And Everyone who says, well, you've got to be you know, an expert. You've got to have an MBA. What's, I was watching this interview with Richard Branson, who's the great billionaire a CEO of Virgin Airways, and I think he, you know, he was doing space tourism. Multi-billionaire, guys. Watch this. This is going to blow your mind. In anything. Going forward 30 or so years, I was running Europe's largest private group of companies, but I didn't know the difference between gross and net profit, but it didn't matter. Yes, I was in a board meeting uh, when I was about 50 years old, and... Um, uh, and the director um, said, um, and I, I think I said, is that good news or bad news? And, the, and, the, and one of the directors said, come, come outside, Richard, a minute. So came outside and said, you don't know the difference between net and gross, do you? So I said, uh, no. Um, uh, 
he said, I thought not. Anyway, I brought a sheet of paper, so she brings out this sheet of paper, and he, uh, he's, he, he has some colour pens, and he, he colours it in blue, and then he puts a fishing net in the um, in it, and then he puts a little fish in the fishing net, and he says, um, so the fish that are in the net, that's your profit at the end of the year, and the rest of the ocean, that's your gross turnover. And um, I went, I've got it. And, uh, <laughs> I was ever ever since then I've been name dropping net and gross to people who obviously know full of full well what it is, <laughs> and, and um, but the, but the point of the story is uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, I mean it's it's a good idea most likely if your your chief, your chief accountant uh, knows, um, uh, but you know for a, for somebody who's running a company, what matters is can you. Um, you know, can you create the best, um, the best company in its sector? You know, if you're going to create an airline, is it going to be palpably better than um, the rival airline? If you create a cruise company, is it going to be palpably better than the other cruise companies? If you're going to create a train company, is it going to be palpably better than what's gone before? And if it is, then at the end of the year, it's likely that more money that will come in than goes out. Um, and um, uh, and then somebody you know somebody else can add up add up the figures. Um, uh, so I think you know to, to be to, to run a to run a business you know yes it helps to add up it helps to subtract it helps to multiply. Um, I don't even think you need to worry about division. Um, that that's it. So um, uh, uh, you know so if you can if you can do those three things. Um, a multi-billionaire uh, guy, run a business ladies and gentlemen. Things. I wouldn't worry too much. You find somebody else you I can. I wouldn't worry too much just, about just it. Just go out and create something that's going to make a positive difference to other people's lives. And the point is, if you, there's this hours-long video by Simon Squibb. For those of you who don't know, he's taken social media by storm. He's a British entrepreneur, a multi-millionaire. He's, of course, also dyslexic, guys. Doesn't even know how to spell, but he's a multi-millionaire. And uh, he made this video on, he teaches everything he knows about business for free. This is information that should have a paywall, guys, but he's revealing it for free. He talks about the fact that you, it's true, guys. You don't have to even try to become better at something that you don't like. You don't have to study things that bore you. You just focus on getting good at those things that excite you. What excites me is reading news and talking about news and then talking about some stocks and making money on those. I don't have to be a professional accountant. I don't have to be a professional investor. I'm going to get rich and make a ton of money by just doing these videos, fleshing out these theses, and we're going to show you the results of that. Of course, the results remain to be seen, but that's my take on this, and I think Richard Branson, Simon Squibb, and others have disproved this thesis that, oh, you've got to go get an education and get a good job. That's nonsense. You go and focus on what you love doing, and you will be successful. If those of you who like geopolitical investing, subscribe to this channel, guys. I invite you to subscribe to the channel, like the videos, help me grow it, and help me, of course, get this information out there, and let's have a very fun conversation where we can benefit each other. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's been reported that there was an assassination att attempt on President-elect Donald Trump by the Iranian government. And it apparently involved operatives reportedly connected to Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps who'd been directed to surveil and potentially eliminate Trump. This directive was part of a broader scheme targeting individuals considered enemies of the Iranian state. To tell you the truth, I am not sure as to the veracity of these claims, but no matter what we think, there may or may not be consequences. It's going to depend upon Trump's instincts. And it had been reported earlier this week, and indeed, this news may have been released simply because it had been reported earlier this week that Trump now realizes the necessity of negotiating with Iran and perhaps lifting sanctions from Iran. This is why there was fear of oil prices actually going down and then of course oil companies losing earnings and earnings and I want to sort of tabletop exercise this play and sort of source ideas 
And in the comments, you can call me out on it. Tell me why I'm wrong. Tell me why you think I'm right. Tell me how we can do better. So, a scenario number one is that Netanyahu, who Trump really doesn't like, but who he has been currying favor with of late simply to appeal maybe to the evangelical base in the United States for Lord knows why, but he may convince him to actually go after Iran in some way or support Israel in going after Iran in some way. Of course, this could increase the volatility in the Middle East, and we know that the oil markets, uh, Jim Rogers talks about the fact that the oil markets are in tune and have their finger on the pulse of the situation in the Middle East, so oil prices should go up. And so, tabletop exercising this, it's, let's say there are Middle East tensions. Analysts watching the Iran situation closely see a few key points. If the U.S. retaliates economically or militarily, Iran could respond by disrupting regional oil flows. Of course, they could close the Strait of Hormuz. Even minor skirmishes in the Gulf, think of the Strait of Hormuz, could spook markets and lead to a jump in oil prices. So, what would be a play based on that? Guys, I am thinking Oxy. And Oxy has been down over the last few days. So, either we could buy Oxy, or if we really wanted to uh, leverage our income, we could buy options. We could buy call options on Oxy. The question is, when would be the correct time to enter that trade? Would it be now before overt tensions have occurred? And while people are still recovering from the thought that oil prices could indeed go down because of, as they say, the risk of peace. That's an amazing statement, the risk of peace. Or should we wait until closer to election time to see what happens? That's why I'm not making any of these trades now. I am putting it out there, and I'd like to know what your thoughts are as well, and I'll be researching it more. Another good trade would be Halliburton, guys. Another interesting trade would be USO, which is the ETF that, that follows the price of oil. These are obvious trades, I think, that were there to be a huge conflict in the Middle East, we could leverage. Now, what if the opposite happens? I tend to think this is the more probable scenario. Whether or not it's true that this plot against Trump occurred, Trump could utilize this to his advantage in negotiations with Iran. He could say, hey guys, either I'm going to use this as an excuse to attack you in some way, or let's use this to make a deal. And Trump makes some kind of deal with Iran. He could say, give up all of your nuclear weapons uh, production capabilities, and we will completely open up the economic markets to you. We will lift the sanctions. What would happen, guys? I tabletop exercised this as well, and I actually asked ChatGPT what would happen if Iran basically opened up. And of course, this would have implications with Russia, uh, this would have implications with China, and so forth. And what I was reading on here Iran's oil and gas would basically release more oil to the markets and that could drive down oil prices. But what it could do, guys, is it could or bolster the stock price of Oxy because they would have more production and therefore ostensibly more sales. It could really help Halliburton and people like Schlumberger, SLB, because they would actually perhaps have contracts to go into Iran and help them drill and refine and so forth because their economy is heavily based upon that. Of course, roads, wet rail, and housing. Basically, their country's falling apart due to sanctions, their infrastructure is falling apart, and perhaps companies like Caterpillar and Siemens may get contracts to supply machinery, engineering, and infrastructure. Uh, also, an emerging markets fund or even a Middle Eastern fund could capture these gains. Of course, consumer goods and technology, companies like Unilever and Nestle, also Ericsson and Nokia might find in Iran a huge new market for their electronic products. It's something to watch, ladies and gentlemen, and I, I will be watching this. We will be watching the situation. Trump could herald in a renaissance of peace 
and that would lead to tons of new possibilities. Again, I'm not driven at this point to focus on only one, but I will be researching it more, and I will let you know my ideas in future podcasts. And again, if you have any more comments on that, please do let me know here. So I got some comments both online and offline last week saying, Javier, you're crazy. There's no way for the average person to make a hundred times as money or ten times as money on bets. You're going to lose all your money, which if you don't have much money, who cares? Because it's not much money anyway, but there's an unlimited upside. But I want to show you just three stocks, guys, that are going to prove to you that you can make outsized returns. The first stock I want you to look at is the Trump bet. Here we have the chart for Geo Group, which is a prison stock. I haven't even done much research on the stock. I've just read in many forums that this is a Trump trade, or it's a Republican trade, and I've been following it. So it's been 3% up today, by the way, or 4% up. This just keeps going up. Guys, in the past five days, it's gone up 77%. Now, what would call options have been on that, depending on when you bought them? Multiples. You would have multiplied your money. It's only a matter of being inspired to buy that stock or having some piece of information that inclined you to buy options on that stock. Guys, in the past month, it's gone up 86%. That could have been the only trade that you put on this year. You could have bet your whole portfolio on it, and you would have, again, not investment advice, of course, but you would have made multiples. So it is possible. The past six months, 86%. If you have held on to it for a year, guys, year to date, well, year to date, meaning the beginning of this year to now, it's gone up 135%. That's a multiple of 2x on your money just by buying the stock. What if you would have bought options? The next stock I want to uh, focus your attention on is called Lumen. Lumen Technologies is a network services, cloud services, and fiber optic company that started bringing on AI, and I want to direct your attention to the stock. It's at uh, 9.59, so not very remarkable, but let's go to the one-year chart. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, if you would have held this stock for the past year, the return on this stock is 712 0.71%. If you would have just held the stock, you have made seven times your money, ladies and gentlemen. So here's another example. What if you would have bought options on that stock? You would have increased your money by multiples, perhaps 10 to 100 times. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is possible. We are continuing to research. I don't have that big thesis yet but it is coming, I'm doing research, and every week I'm going to be forcing myself to make one of these podcasts, primarily as a journal and a timestamp, but also so that we can have a discussion about these things. Let's get rich together, ladies and gentlemen. So, hope you have a great week, and until very soon, until next week, this is Javier with the Geopolitical Investors Cafe, Geopolitical Investors Podcast. See y'all very soon.